Listen, who cares? Right, right. I got a surprise for you. And that is the Fourth Amendment doesn't just protect criminals. It protects everyone in this room, and it deals with your rights as individuals in this country. This country was founded upon individual rights and specifically the rights and certain expectations of privacy in your home, in your house, in your properties. We left Great Britain because we felt so strongly about the invasion of our rights. Whether we were innocent or guilty, we didn't want this monarch and King George saying, hey, you gotta let us look at your shit with this, these writs of assistance back in 1760. And if you don't, it doesn't matter because I'm the king and you're mere colonists. You don't get these important rights of Englishmen. That pissed off a lot of colonists and we ended up going to war and we formed our country. And we've been fighting for those rights ever since. Now, I wanna start the proceedings with a very brief clip. Some of you may have already seen it. I send it to a lot of my clients but the key word there, there is my clients because it's too late for them. The ACLQ put out a really nice little thing about here's what happens when you fell asleep in seventh grade civics class and you didn't know your Fourth Amendment rights. Plus a few fifth and sixth amendment rights. Uh, my son. Devin, go ahead, hit it. Damn it! Oh crap. Oh, this really sucks. Is everything put away? Um, yeah. I think so. Everything's cool, we'll be fine. We we're probably just speeding or something. We were going that fast. License and registration, please. Can you grab my registration out of the place? Kids going to the concert? Yes, sir. Do you know why I pulled you over? Uh, I guess I was speeding, sir. You know how fast you were going? I don't know, uh, maybe 45. Clock to you at 50. Do you know what the speed limit is on this road? Uh, I think it's 30 miles per hour, sir. That's right. Which means you were driving 20 miles per hour with the speed limit. Did you know that I could arrest you for driving that fast? But it didn't seem like we were driving Did that fast. Did you know that I could arrest you for driving that fast? No. Do you have any alcohol or illegal drugs in this car? No, sir. What about your friend? Looks a little out of it. Donna, you feeling all right? You look a little spacey. Uh, I'm just, I'm just a little nervous. It's all nervous. You shouldn't be nervous unless you have something to hide, right? So, is there anything you want to tell me? All right, everyone, step out of the car, please. You don't have any drugs in here? You don't mind if I take a look, do you? No. Damn, this car is disgusting. You guys are a bunch of animals. I'm just trying to make a living here. I don't know why you got to make me dig through all this crap. Jeez, it smells like Bob Marley's ass in here. You kids been toking the reefer or what? <laughs> Who belongs to this? That's mine. You don't have any drugs in here? No. You don't have to take a look then? What if I say no? Daryl Borden, I want you to listen to me very closely. You have two choices. You can either make things better, or you can make things worse for yourself. If you cooperate with me, I'll help you. Do you understand me? 
Yeah. If you choose not to cooperate with me, I can't help you. I'll have to arrest you and keep you overnight in a jail cell with some very bad men who would love to do some very bad things to skinny little boys like the two of you. Do you understand your choice? Friends take the full rep for this, are you? Tell me the truth. Were you smoking on this too? No, we didn't smoke any today. We we're just gonna smoke at the concert. I appreciate your honesty. But this isn't Amsterdam. In the United States, you're in possession of an illegal and dangerous substance, and I'm gonna have to place you all under arrest. Everyone put your hands on the car. Now. It all goes Victor 11 going 10, 15, three times, requesting backup. I'm gonna read you your rights now. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. A time wait. Don't be a Daryl. Because there's so many things that went wrong in that video. What I'd like to do tonight is go over essentially three topic areas. First, very brief, Reader's Digest version of the Fourth Amendment and how we got to where we are today. Hold on fast because we're going to cover 3,000 years in about two or three minutes. Second, the real reason I'm here is because I like to share war stories with people that haven't heard them yet. And I've got a few of them that have gone up to the Court of Appeals, Virginia Supreme Court. Most of them have had their genesis just a few blocks from where you're sitting right now literally a couple of blocks away many of these cases had their origin and went up to the court of appeals and illustrate the fourth amendment and how in the context of the fourth amendment i've addressed it with my clients and then finally the moral of this story and how daryl could have handled the situation just a little bit better so with that we'll go ahead and start with a quick run through the history of the fourth amendment starting 3,400 years ago the book of exodus Chapter 22, verse 2, Judeo-Christian thought is, your home is sacrosanct, especially if somebody should try to invade it in the middle of the night. You have the right to kill them because that's an invasion of your personal space. Fast forward another 600 years, we get to Cicero. Cicero writes, uh, Cicero's a great legal scholar at the time, uh, discusses again the importance of the home and why it is something that needs to be protected. And um, we, we fast forward another 500 years and we get to the Byzantine Emperor Justine and he held a freeman could not be summoned from his house. Sounds an awful lot like the Fourth Amendment and that's 1500 years ago. We fast forward now to 1112, 11, help me out here, 11, 1115, this is June, June. Okay. <laughs> There's a little quarrel with the nobles in England and a guy named King John who's really pissed them off. He's a horrible king. I don't think there was ever a, a King John II after King John I. And the nobles went over to Ronnie Mead and said, you better sign this Magna Carta or we're going to do some really bad things to you. And King John kind of had no choice, went along with it. And in the Magna Carta, there's a reference to at least for the nobleman, the importance of recognizing certain due process rights. It also established a foundation for a rule of law. 
that this law applies to all of us, at least at that point to the noble. And, and that becomes important because later, it is a little confusion and a myth that the Magna Carta applied to ordinary people like me. It didn't apply to me. I wasn't a noble. Wouldn't have been a noble back then. I've done a little genealogy, and I'm sure of that back. So we go forward a little bit further, and we get to 1760. I'm sorry, 1604. And in England, it is held the proposition by Edward Coke, great jurisprudence philosopher. I'm sure all of you are familiar with his works. Uh, states, for a man's house is his castle. You've probably heard that statement several times before. My place, my home, my castle. And we, we fast forward to the writs of assistance, and we get into a horrible king, King George III. And 1760 comes along, and he's looking at these navigation acts and basically looking for ways to screw over the colonists. And he does that through the writs of assistance. That really pisses some people off. So we fast forward to 1761 and come up with James Otis. James Otis is a lawyer up in Massachusetts, young lawyer, and he goes out and says, you know what, this is a fundamental liberty. This is something precious to everybody that we have to hold sacrosanct, that you just don't invade someone's space without some sort of due process, without some probable cause. And in that audience is a guy named John Adams. I remember him, second president of the United States. He's listening to James Otis talk, and he, he walks away from that trial. He's a young man at this point, I think he's 26. And he said, there, there in that courtroom with James Otis were the first sparks of liberty, the need, the yearning for independence, all arising out of a concept of the Fourth Amendment, which happens Fast forward, 1776, in Virginia, George Mason. George, George Mason is, America. I'm just testing him. He's got a rough <laughs> up for week. George Mason drafts the Declaration of, 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 of a declar thank you, Virginia Declaration of Rights, which later gets copied in large part in the Bill of Rights, 17. 1781, 1779, and uh, James Madison. Jesus, I remember the college of James Mason, James Madison. Got it. Okay, traveling that direction, and he incorporates what has been this this English thinking of a man's house as his castle into what turns into a fundamental bill of rights, the Fourth Amendment. And I never get tired of reading this because. The language in there is so important to every American, and that's where we get to the Fourth Amendment. The right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated, and no warrant shall issue but upon probable cause supported by oath or affirmation in particularly describing the place to be searched and the person or the thing to be searched. That's powerful stuff. That's government, you can't do these things unless you follow this, this cornerstone of our country. And we fast forward to the Patriot Act taking away most of those rights, but at least in fairness, watering them down a large amount. And the good news is the Supreme Court hasn't completely abandoned the Fourth Amendment. Although if you practice criminal defense law like I do in the trenches for the past 28 years, perhaps you think it has been diminished a great deal, because it has. But recently we have the Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court holding in Cal Raleigh versus California that Considering this long history of the Fourth Amendment, when we apply it to something that our family fathers would never have conceived thinking about, a cell phone. Can you imagine George Washington and Thomas Jefferson talking on cell phones one another? Of course not. They never 
never thought of it, but it encompassed the same thinkings of privacy and expectations of privacy as you have in one's own home, in one's own personal papers, in effect. You've got secret stuff on your cell phone. I know some of you are playing with them now. You've got secret stuff there, and you probably wouldn't want me or Dr. Gatman or a local policeman looking at your cell phone because you got secret stuff that you don't really want other people to be looking at. I'm not suggesting you drug you, by the way, <laughs> just to let you know. But the point is, this is special to you. And a 9-0 decision, the United States Supreme Court upheld the suppression motion in that case, finding that when poor Mr. Riley gets stopped and, he, and they go through his phone, and they're not really sure which apps are private, which are not. In fact, one of the justices didn't even know how to turn his cell phone on, which is a little scary when you got Chief Justice of the Supreme Court deciding important issues. They don't know how to turn their cell phones on. They, they decided that it's just too invasive. And that was a decision from last year. So, all sum total, we still have the Fourth Amendment. It's been watered down a great deal, but it's still there and something that you have a right to assert. So, we now get to the next slide. War stories, I'm afraid of fire. That's me. I'm a little bit younger there. But I'm on my Harley. I'm enjoying the wind through my hair when I had hair and enjoying the freedoms, and I want my clients to enjoy them as well. In the course of being a freedom fighter, I have encountered people like Daryl from the video that didn't really exercise their rights like they could have. Thus, they became clients. The first war story I want to share with you, asleep in a vehicle. Client is in Winchester. He um, is at a party all late at night, parks in a legal parking spot, and this was about, let's say, two, three blocks away from here. And somebody calls the police and says, there's a black man sleeping in a car and it looks suspicious. Sorry to think, you know, driving a black. What the hell? <laughs> I know, right? I'll tell you a story about driving my lawyer later, but that's a private story. <laughs> and the police come over and they start to do the little, wake up, wake up seven in the morning. Well, this guy just went to sleep a few hours ago. It's like he's a little groggy. And the front driver, he gets up and you know, he's like, it's fine. So he gets out of the car and the police officer is trying to get the passenger who's sleeping in the back to wake up. And, and, he, and you won't wake up. No indication of distress. So we, we don't have a uh, Dombrowski exception to the search warrant requirement. You know, the good, the, the uh, community caretaker exception to the Fourth Amendment. Oh, that poor guy in the back sleeping, but he could be in, in pain. He could be hurt for all. He, no indication of that. So police get him out of the car, and lo and behold, he's got a little bit of white powdered substance in his pocket. Somebody could have planted it there. It's probably his. But in any event, it's an illegal Schedule II controlled substance. He's not supposed to have it. So now he's jacked up with a felony. And then it gets really complicated because there's a firearm under the seat where he was sleeping. And okay, so there may have been a kilo of coke under the seat as well. So it gets really complicated really fast. So here I am having to argue in front of Judge Wetzel, feel sorry for my client because he has a constitutional right that needs to be respected if you want him to respect your law. And it's so important, it trumps all those other laws that he probably violated. That's kind of a tough sell. How do you get, you feel sorry for this guy who's got a gun and drugs? And it's not supposed to, by the way. It's a really bad combination. The federal court does really horrible things to you. So, Judge Wetzel, a UVA grad, I guess they sleep in their cars a lot down there, thinks to himself, I remember being on Rugby Road, sleeping in my car at four in the morning, and you know what? I don't think I would have liked being roused in the morning at seven o'clock by the local police. Motion granted. Downwind. Yay! Client walked. Can't believe what happened. I say, just, you need to go now. <laughs> Where they changed their mind. And, uh, 
I don't know why I share this story with you, other than the fact that it illustrates the point that you've got this fundamental right that has to be respected in Trump, all of these other rights. And the people that are being protected are not just that poor fellow who fell asleep and, well, sleeping black. And he represents the front line of people that are being penalized by those rights being violated. Because if his rights can be violated, everyone else in this room's rights can be violated as well. That's worth story number one. Number two, this one's gonna take a while. This is a personal battle of mine, if you will, that I've been waging for about 12 years. Here's the background. 12 years ago, it was a very popular way to stop people in Winchester and in Frederick County because of those annoying little dangling objects from the rear view mirror. I got a question, all the people in here, who has a dangling object in their rear view mirror right now? That is against the law. It is against the law and you can be stopped for that violation anytime, anywhere, regardless of the fact that it probably doesn't obstruct your view of the highway. Now, 12 years ago, I go in front of Judge West and I say, Judge, this just seems really unfair. The statute talks about obstructing the view of the highway and we really don't have evidence that my guy, my driver, was, was had his view obstructed. And the reason I have these two horrible pictures, one horrible picture of myself and the other view, is the crime deals with the view of the driver, not the view of the policeman stopping the driver, but, oh, I see a dangling object. Ergo, it must be breaking the law. That's not the law. It has to obstruct the driver's view. So I take the camera and take a shot of it, of what I'm looking at in front of me. Highway, I'm too cheap for the little red camera, I'm sorry. Dangling object, something over there, not highway. Highway, not highway. Okay. To help bolster my argument, because I don't think Judge Wetzel's just gonna change his mind, let all those guilty people run free, I bring in a physicist who explains that the motion of the pendulum of the, the, the thing, and then you got this, this uh, 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 picket fence effect, and, and ultimately nobody's view of anything's being obstructed. So he grants my motion, and Rocky Watts walks out of the courtroom, he beats, I think it was a drug drug. Three months later, Commonwealth versus Penn comes along. Same argument, different defense lawyer. He later became a prosecutor, and I understand that's another story. The judge reverses himself. He says, that downs, he bedazzled me. And that's, the, that's in the case of Kenyon. He bedazzled me. The real rule is, if it's hanging, you can be stopped. I was devastated. I lost the case, then it wasn't even my case. I was just like, ah, I gotta kill Derek for doing that. His name's Derek Askin, by the way. He's a swing <laughs> Thanks a lot, Derek. Thanks a lot, Derek. So, the next 10 years go by, and other states around the country have similar horrible statutes, but they take a little different view. They say, we need to look at the fact and not have this conclusionary position, this per se rule that you're in violation if something's dangling. And every other state that ruled on this issue ruled with me. They agreed. They said, yeah, Mr. Downs, you were right. Judge Wetzel's now wrong. Well, they didn't exactly say that, but that was the effect of it. And to justify a stop for something like a traffic violation, you need what's called reasonable articulable suspicion. And the reason for that is not probable cause. It's not like the probable cause for a search warrant, but that lower standard, which is a little more than a hunch, is because in theory, it's, it's, a, it's a de minimis stop or inconvenience. It's just a temporary detention to see if you're breaking the law. It's okay. 
So we make you a little late for your prom date or your, your class with Dr. Gatman. It's okay because the needs of the society are greater than your individual rights. So, 10 years pass, all these other states disagree, and a case called Mason comes up to fight. Mason was decided last year by the Virginia Court of Appeals. Right, and then it was decided wrong. Three judge panel, Judge Humphreys leading the decision, says, you know what? Judge Wetzel's wrong, Mr. Downs, he was really right 12 years ago, and we're gonna throw out this stop because it's truly not an obstruction, it's just silly. You know, they, they, they were like, I bet if we polled half the people at a Shenandoah University class, half of them will raise their hand that they got a dangling off. They, they could see this class session happening in a dance. Because you drive the highways, that's about what you're gonna get. About half the people are gonna have the, the fuzzy dyes, the, the graduation tassels, the, the air fresheners, the, the, the religious medallions. That, that's no big deal, right? But it, but under Winchester law at the time, it was a per se rule. Anything hanging was a violation. Mason's decided on a 2-1 decision. Humphreys decides it uh, for the majority. It goes up in bonk. Uh, six judges disagree with Judge Humphreys and myself, and five of them agreed with, with me. Uh, unfortunately, six beats five, and Hump, in, in the case of Mason, got reversed. It's now on appeal to the Supreme Court. So the moral of this story is, take the dangling objects down for the time being, because we don't know what the Supreme Court will do. Now the reason I mentioned Freeman is because I came in after Mason was decided, argued that the statute was unconstitutionally vague, and therefore should be void, because it is such a horrible statute that six judges think it does obstruct, and five judges think that it doesn't. And, and my argument was pretty simple. If there's so much disagreement with presumably reasonable-minded men, they're judges, that maybe the statute's a little vague. Their response to that wasn't well received by me. Their response was, who cares? Because the poor police officer should not be expected to know that the statute might be constitutionally invalid. And that kind of makes sense in the extent that you got the General Assembly and the, and the governor who have passed this law, and you got this poor policeman who's just trying to do his job, like the Daryl State, and, and he's following what the judges are interpreting, so why should he be penalized under the exclusionary rule? Briefly explain the exclusionary rule. It's supposed to deter police misconduct, police misbehaving, police acting poorly, police intentionally violating your rights. So, they asked me to put together a brief based on the opinion of North Carolina versus Hines, which was, uh, you're familiar with Hines. Hines is a horrible, horrible case. Decided last year by the United States Supreme Court that says that this poor guy, Hines, is driving through North Carolina and the police officer stops him because one of his, his tag lights is out. Well, guess what? The statute's kind of poorly written, but the bottom line is you only needed one tag light in North Carolina. So poor Mr. Hines wasn't breaking the law. And the response by the U.S. Supreme Court was, on an 8 one decision, who cares? It doesn't matter, because the policeman thought it was breaking the law. We'll just give him a pass. Now that it's been cleared up, we might not let him stop any more people for that reason. He'll probably come up with another excuse like dangling objects. But for the time being, we'll let him excuse that mistake of law and uphold the stop which is what they did. So my counter response to that to the Court of Appeals was, look, at some point you gotta tell the people that this is a bad statute and kick it out so that we don't keep having these police officers use it as their, their, 
predicate of basis for stopping individuals. By the way, in Freeman, no, he's driving black. He is suspected of being a drug dealer. The special drug task force over in Winchester, Frederick County go, we're gonna go investigate him. So they follow him for half the day. And he doesn't commit any violations. It's amazing, I'm, I'm frankly impressed that he could do that in Clark County, which is ultimately where he ended up, without doing anything wrong. So finally they get, they say, oh, F it. He's, he's got a dangling object. Look him, Dano. And that's what they did. They stopped him because of the dangling object. They, they didn't. Three drug task force guys spending half the day to, to give somebody a $30 ticket for an air freshener? Come on. The sad part is the United States Supreme Court <coughs> upholds those kind of stops. These, these 